Okay, so welcome back. Uh, I made a major mistake. I did not record, so I just started recording. So we'll just have a few minutes on the record. So if you're listening to this, you know, you can always do the interactive uh, PowerPoint. So thank you. I see you're kind of coming in quick with the chat. So I think that we don't all have funny, um, funny, uh, what are we doing? Analogies or something. So I did see a couple in here. I see it's just being named, so that's okay. Um, a bald spot is like a lie. The bigger it gets, the harder it is to cover it up. Oh, that is so, that's a good one, Stephanie. I like that one. Yes, I do. And have you ever seen somebody that lies and then they dig the hole deeper and deeper? Yeah, I like that one. I'm going to see if I can read any more if anybody is, is in here. Um, what type of thing are we supposed to type? You just got to work. Hmm. Oh, I see what you mean. You're supposed to type in a funny analogy, which was that one about a ball spot. Just a sword is a weapon of a warrior. A pen is a weapon of a rider. When warriors fight on the battlefield. Yeah, that's good. Life is a, like a race. In a, in a race, the competitor who runs fast and continually does so will eventually win. That's true. That's good. I like that. Students stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, uh, Natasha, I got a question on that one, okay? Um, I'm not a giant, so your students are learning from me. So that's kind of funny for me. I like it. I mean, I think it's really good. I'm not saying it's bad. I just think it's funny. I'm not a giant. But then good things come in small packages is what I was told from when I was so little. And then we are to Felicia ones that I really like. People are like stained glass windows. They sparkle and shine when the sun is out, but when the darkness is in, their true beauty is revealed only if there's a light from within. I like that. Okay, so what we're going to do for the rest of the um, half hour that we have, or a little bit longer maybe, I'm gonna play some TED videos. And while I'm playing some good TED videos, they're fun. Um, if you cannot hear, you can maybe do the CC, whatever. Oh, I think you might have this on my uh, mail. Do we have it still sharing? I've got iCloud in there. Okay, resume share, there we go. So we're going to look here at TED Talk. And this one doesn't say the year, but it's supposed to be really good. It's episode three of others that I did. So we're going to go on this one. I don't know. I'm going to go on the first one that I like. So um, this is metaphorically speaking. And I'm going to screen share first. Back to 20 people. That's good. So 19 of you are staying here. There he is. I don't know who that is, though, actually. James Geary. And it's from 11 years ago. It's kind of ancient. But he got billions of people. And he talks about metaphorically speaking. It's supposed to be funny. So I'm going to play it. Dropbox. Can you hear it? Where all things work, all in one place. Let's see, can you Metaphor hear? lives a secret life yes. all around us. Okay, good. I'm going to make it large. Oh. Thinking is essential to how we understand ourselves, others, how we communicate, learn, discover, and invent. The metaphor is a way of thought before it is a way with words. Now, to assist me in explaining this, I've enlisted the help of one of our greatest philosophers, the reigning king of the metaphorians, a man whose contributions to the field are so great that he himself has become a metaphor. I am, of course, referring to none other 
and Elvis Presley. <laughs> now, All Shook Up is a great love song. It's also a great example of how whenever we deal with anything abstract, ideas, emotions, feelings, concepts, thoughts, we inevitably resort to metaphor. In All Shook Up, a touch is not a touch, but a chill. Lips are not lips, but volcanoes. She is not she, but a buttercup. And love is not love, but being all shook up. In this, Elvis is following Aristotle's classic definition of metaphor as the process giving the thing a name that belongs to something else. This is the mathematics of metaphor. Fortunately, it's very simple. X equals Y. This formula works wherever metaphor is present. Elvis uses it, but so does Shakespeare. His famous line from Romeo and Juliet, Juliet is the sun. Now here, Shakespeare gives the thing, Juliet, a name that belongs to something else, the sun. But whenever we give a thing a name that belongs to something else, we give it a whole network of analogies too. We mix and match what we know about the metaphor's source, in this case, the sun, with what we know about its target, Juliet. The metaphor gives us a much more vivid understanding of Juliet than if Shakespeare had literally described what she looks like. So how do we make and understand metaphors? This might look familiar. First step is pattern recognition. Look at this image. What do you see? Pac-Man. Three wayward Pac-Man, three pointy brackets are actually present. What we see, however, are two overlapping triangles. Metaphor is not just the detection of patterns, it is the creation of patterns. Second step, conceptual synesthesia. Now, synesthesia is the experience of a stimulus in one sense organ in another sense organ as well, such as colored hearing. People with colored hearing actually see colors when they hear the sounds of words or letters. We all have synesthetic abilities. This is the Booba Kiki test. What you have to do is identify which of these shapes is called Booba and which is called Kiki. If you're like 98% of other people, you will identify the round amoeboid shape as Booba and the sharp spiky one as Kiki. Can we do a quick show of hands? Does that correspond? Okay, I think 99.9 .9 would about cover it. Why do we do that? because we instinctively find or create a pattern between the round shape and the round sound of booba and the spiky shape and the spiky sound of kiki. And many of the metaphors we use every day are synesthetic. Silence is sweet. Neckties are loud. Sexually attractive people are hot. Sexually unattractive people leave us cold. Metaphor creates a kind of conceptual synesthesia in which we understand one concept in the context of another. Third step is cognitive dissonance. This is the stroke test. What you need to do here is identify as quickly as possible the color of the ink in which these words are printed. You can take the test now. If you're like most people, you will experience a moment of cognitive dissonance when the name of the color is printed in a differently colored ink. The test shows that we cannot ignore the literal meaning of words, even when the literal meaning gives the wrong answer. Stroke tests have been done with metaphor as well. The participants had to identify as quickly as possible the literally false sentences. They took longer to reject metaphors as false than they did to reject literally false sentences. Why? Because we cannot ignore the metaphorical meaning of words either. One of the sentences was, some jobs are jails. Now, unless you're a prison guard, the sentence, some jobs are jails, is literally false. Sadly, it's metaphorically true. And the metaphorical truth interferes with our ability to identify it as literally false. Metaphor matters because it's around us every day, all the time. Metaphor matters because it creates expectations. Pay careful attention the next time you read the financial news. Agent metaphors describe price movements as the deliberate action of a living thing, as in the NASDAQ climbed higher. Object metaphors describe price movements as non-living things, as in the Dow fell like a brick. Researchers asked a group of um, 
people to read a clutch of market commentaries and then predict the next day's price trend. Those exposed to agent metaphors had higher expectations that the price trends would continue. They had those expectations because agent metaphors imply the deliberate action of a living thing pursuing a goal. If, for example, house prices are routinely described as climbing and climbing higher and higher, people might naturally assume that that rise is unstoppable. They may feel confident, say, in taking out mortgages they really can't afford. That's a hypothetical example, of course. But this is how metaphor misleads. Metaphor also matters because it influences decisions by activating analogies. A group of students was told that a small democratic country had been invaded and had asked the US for help. And they had to make a decision. What should they do? Intervene, appeal to the UN, or do nothing. They were each then given one of three descriptions of this hypothetical crisis, each of which was designed to tr trigger a different historical analogy. World War II, Vietnam, and the third was historically neutral. Those exposed to the World War II scenario made more interventionist recommendations than the others. Just as we cannot ignore the literal meaning of words, we cannot ignore the analogies that are triggered by metaphor. Metaphor matters because it opens the door to discovery. Whenever we solve a problem or make a discovery, we compare what we know with what we don't know. The only way to find out about the latter is to investigate the ways it might be like the former. Einstein described his scientific method as combinatory play. He famously used thought experiments, which are essentially elaborate analogies, to come up with some of his greatest discoveries. By bringing together what we know and what we don't know through analogy, metaphorical thinking strikes the spark that ignites discovery. Now, metaphor is ubiquitous, yet it's hidden. But you just have to look at the words around you, and you'll find it. Ralph Waldo Emerson described language as fossil poetry. But before it was fossil poetry, language was fossil metaphor. And these fossils still breathe. Take the three most famous words in all of Western philosophy, cogito ergo sum. It's routinely translated as I think, therefore I am. But there's a better translation. The Latin word cogito is derived from the prefix co, meaning together, and the verb agitare, meaning to shake. So the original meaning of cogito is to shake together. And the proper translation of cogito ergo sum is I shake things up, therefore I am. <laughs> Metaphor shakes things up, giving us everything from Shakespeare to scientific discovery in the process. The mind is a plastic snow dome, most beautiful, most interesting, and most itself when, as Elvis put it, it's all shook up. And metaphor keeps the mind shaking, rattling and rolling long after Elvis has left the building. Thank you very much. <laughs> Challenge the past. Come on. Challenge accepted. Purdue University Global. Affordable it's not online education doing for escape. working adults. Apply now at purdueglobal.edu. Okay, recommended the idea go straight to your box. No, I just want to hit escape. All right, we're going to go on this one. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to let's see. Metaphorically speaking, we already did that one. There we are. Now, have any of y'all? There we go. Now we're going to listen to uh, the hidden power of analogy. And this didn't come under funny analogy, so I'm hoping that this will be as good. Um, after this one, which is how many minutes? doesn't say, doesn't have very many views. But um, after this one, you can go, and I'm still gonna record. You're free to go because you've done your time, and um, I don't wanna hold you in a prison. So, hey, I just did an analogy. All righty, let's go for this one. Let me tell you a story. When I was 34, 
What happened there? Let me see. I got the chance of a lifetime. A job interview at the White House. I'm a presidential speechwriter. Unfortunately, uh, as I sat there uh, watching the chief speechwriter read through my resume, he started frowning. And he looks up and he says, there's a lot of other projects going on. What's this about building a cork boat? And I told him the truth that uh, since the age of seven, I'd been saving corks from wine bottles to build a Viking ship. And that my plan was eventually, when I had enough, got the boat built to take it on an epic voyage through the canals of French wine country. And he just looked at me like, who is this nut job? And I could feel the entire interview and my, my shot at the White House slipping away. I didn't know what to say. And then all of a sudden, this analogy pops into my head. And I said, sir, building a cork boat and writing a good speech are a lot alike. In both cases, Take a jumble of small things, quirks or words that don't do much on their own. But if you put them into just the right order, they'll take you on an amazing voyage. He got the analogy and I got the job. And that's the thing about a good analogy at the right moment, uh, because it helps people see things from an entirely fresh uh, perspective. And tonight I'm going to talk about uh, the impact that analogies can uh, make on, on the world and how each of us can strengthen our own analogical instinct. First, some of you might be wondering what exactly is an analogy? After all, they come in a lot of different disguises, metaphors, cliches, parables, proverbs, legal arguments. Here's a useful definition. At its core, an analogy is a comparison that asserts similarities between two different things. And whether we realize it or not, we make analogical comparisons all the time. For example, when we use our phones to navigate and get from A to B, we follow the blue dot on the screen and we're looking up and comparing that uh, to the real world around us. That map is a two-dimensional analog of the three-dimensional world. And intuitively, we just uh, filter out everything that's different about the two, and almost everything is, to zero in on uh, the relevant similarities that, that get us where we want to go. And that capacity to uh, filter and compare uh, is our analogical instinct hard at work. Now, as we navigate the world of ideas, the, uh, a good analogy as a creative catalyst can take us places we never even imagined. For example, uh, what do pigs and cars have in common? Most of us would say nothing. Uh, but in 1913, a, a Detroit mechanic named Bill Klan took a trip to Chicago where he went on a tour of the Swift meatpacking plant. And Swift had this incredibly efficient system for uh, dismembering and processing millions of pigs and sheep and cattle every year. And, and uh, it was uh, simple. They, they hung the carcasses on an overhead uh, track from a hook and assign butchers to make a designated cut. They'd slide the, the meat on down to the next butcher for the next cut and, and so on. And Klan, who worked for the Ford Motor Company, uh, drew an analogy and he asked himself, well, if they can use a, a moving track to disassemble pigs, why couldn't we just reverse the process to assemble cars? And so he took this idea for moving assembly back to Detroit where his bosses, including Henry Ford, thought it was a stupid idea. But he insisted, no, this is going to change the world. This is revolutionary. Give it a try. And they put in a line, actually when Henry Ford was out of town on business. And lo and behold, it made a dramatic and immediate impact. Uh, uh, before the line went in, it took a, a team of workers uh, about 12 and a half hours to make a Model T. With the line, 90 minutes per car. And that let Ford make a, a lot more cars at a lot lower cost. 
double wages uh, and create the first mass market for automobiles in America. And even more importantly, it completely revolutionized manufacturing in every other industry, unlocking trillions in, in economic potential and, and changing the course of history. And that's the great thing about a great analogy. It can show us entirely new ways of getting a job done, better ways of getting a job done. But be careful, because if we choose the wrong analogy, uh, it can have terrible consequences and lead us uh, astray. Um, ask yourself, why does uh, uh, the United States incarcerate 2.3 million people? That's a quarter of the world's entire prison population. Well, one major contributing factor is a, is a very seductive uh, yet flawed uh, analogy. And here, here's how it happened. In 1994, uh, a father whose daughter had been murdered uh, by, uh, in a botched robbery uh, by a pair of uh, convicted felons uh, led a ballot initiative in California uh, to require mandatory sentences of 25 years to life for a third felony conviction. And he called it three strikes and you're out. And three strikes was an easy sell. After all, baseball is fair. Everybody plays by the same rules and everybody is held accountable for their errors. And California voters passed it in a landslide and about half the other states uh, followed suit with their own version of, of three strikes uh, laws. Now, did this take violent felons off the street? Absolutely. Unfortunately, uh, it caught a lot of other people uh, as well, uh, because judges who had previously had some discretion in sentencing were now required by law to sentence all third strikes uh, uh, to long sentences, whether that third strike was uh, a shoplifting a video or stealing loose change from a parked car or passing a, a bad check. And, and what did this do? It filled up our prisons uh, at a cost of now $75 billion, billion dollars a year, and thousands and thousands of ruined lives. Now, the problem, uh, so we, we have to revisit the, the, the analogy and ask, why should baseball be the model for sentencing policy? And the problem is not that uh, uh, three strikes and you're out, it oversimplifies things because all analogies simplify. That's, that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, it's that the emotional appeal, uh, uh, baseball is fair, distracted millions and millions of voters uh, from more relevant disqualifying differences between the game of baseball and criminal justice. But before we dismiss emotional, emotionally appealing analogies, we need to recognize that those emotional appeals can be extraordinarily uh, empowering as well. A few minutes ago, uh, I talked about using our phones uh, to navigate. Uh, well, when I was growing up in, here in Ann Arbor, you couldn't just slip a computer in your pocket. Uh, it, it took up the mainframe here at U of M, took up the entire floor of a building right next door. The building's gone, and so is the mainframe. Uh, but uh, the other thing was that, that you had to be a techie or a scientist to use it. And computers were something that to most people were alien and unfriendly. Steve Jobs changed all that with a friendly, an explicitly friendly analogy. The desktop, along with the intuitive digital icons of tools that people already knew how to use. Folders, documents, scissors, a trash can. And he reasoned that if people felt comfortable uh, using those tools on a regular physical desk, they ought to be just as comfortable uh, using them uh, in a digital equivalent. 
Now, of course, it wasn't his idea originally. The, the concept was first developed at Xerox, but management there didn't recognize its potential. Jobs did uh, and put it to work uh, designing and, and launching the Mac in 1984. And almost overnight, millions of people could suddenly use a computer, but more importantly, they wanted to use a computer. Uh, and that democratized computing power. It reshaped our relationship with information, and it revolutionized the way that millions and millions of people work and communicate uh, today. Now, you might say, oh, the desktop, that's obvious. Or the moving assembly line, oh, anybody could have thought of that. But they didn't because those, uh, those underlying analogies uh, were, were, were not obvious uh, or else other people would have exploited them. Uh, and similarly, you might say that three strikes and you're out was obviously a dumb analogy. Um, but yet millions of people rushed to embrace it. So my point is not that analogies are good or bad per se, but that we as citizens need to think very critically uh, about those we encounter because they shape how we respond uh, to challenges and opportunities. Someone asked uh, Thomas Edison once, what qualities do you look for in an inventor? And he said, three things. First, imagination. Second, persistence. And third was a logical mind that sees analogies. And that's because we can only explain or invent something new uh, by recombining or reconfiguring or reimagining what we already have or know. The world today has a lot of problems. Climate change, rising sea levels, pandemics, mass extinction, uh, and we're unlikely to solve these problems with yesterday's thinking because it was yesterday's thinking that got us into this mess. We need new solutions, new ideas, new breakthroughs, and these are inevitably going to flow from the creative wellspring of analogy. Fortunately, our analogical instinct uh, is like a muscle. The more we exercise it, the stronger it gets. So for those of you who want to sharpen your thinking, boost your creative metabolism, and improve your problem-solving skills, here are three guidelines. First, practice spotting all the analogies you encounter uh, in your daily life. Once you start paying close attention, you'll see and hear them everywhere. Second, once you spot an analogy, challenge the argument that it's making. What about that analogy isn't true? And how uh, relevant are its strengths and weaknesses? And finally, when you are trying to solve a problem, uh, consider multiple analogies, because usually uh, different analogies will shed useful light on different aspects of the problem. In the end, we have to remember uh, analogies are just models that help us uh, interpret and understand the world. And no analogy is ever going to be perfect. Uh, as the great statistician E.P. Box once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. I would add, some can even change the world. So I wish you well in all your endeavors and may your best analogies ring true. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. I'm going to kick these off as well. There we go. All righty. So that should conclude um, our day together because we just spent about two hours, 45 minutes. So I think that's long enough. So. Um, I think I will say goodbye and I will get those papers graded, hopefully no later than early tomorrow morning, early meaning 
10 or 11 because um, I hike in the morning and I'm not going to be back. I got to take my car in for repair, which I wish I had an analogy for that. So count your analogies and we'll talk to you later. Okay. Yeah, you have a great week too and be productive. Okay, I'm signing out. New messages.